Let's talk about ketamine, which is a little bit different. So instead of working on the GABA receptors, it works on NMDA receptors. And NMDA receptors, the agonist for this in your body is uh, glutamate. Glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in your central nervous system. So ketamine is an antagonist of the NMDA, NMDA receptors. Glutamate would usually bind to these receptors and then it will allow calcium to come through. Ketamine will sit basically inside this receptor and block that calcium from coming through. So that is ketamine acting as a NMDA receptor antagonist. So the effects of this are, um, it's called a dissociative. Being a dissociative agent means that it causes decreased relay of sensory info. And we know the thalamus is in charge of sending um, basic sensory information to areas of your brain that know how to process it. Um, so basically the effect of this is decreased awareness. It doesn't necessarily make a person look like they're falling asleep. Um, they will still have their eyes open, they may swallow, but they will have decreasing abilities to respond to um, any sensory stimuli. So although things may be happening around them, they cannot be aware of them. This is in contrast with propofol and etomidate, which are clearly causing decrease in arousal or wakefulness. Um, so for uh, consciousness, I don't want to get into this too much, but you basically need um, to be aware of things and you also need to be awake. So decrease arousal with propofol versus decrease awareness of things with ketamine. Another thing that sets ketamine apart from propofol and etomidate is its roots available to give. So you can give it IV, but you can also give IM, which is very useful. It can be a PO medication, sub-Q, nasal. You can even give it rectal if you want. So this opens up a lot of options for people, especially if you don't have adequate IV access. Um, some dosing notes here. Uh, hallucination is a common uh, side effect of ketamine and this will happen around 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. So just keep this in mind with, uh, with comparison to these other doses that we're giving. So induction dose looks something like one to two milligrams per kilogram IV. Um, and it can also be given I IM, of course, and we'll need higher doses for that. So about double, so three to five milligrams per kilogram IM. Can be given for maintenance of general anest anesthetic too. So that'd be two to six milligrams per kilogram per hour IV. You can also use a lighter sedation and for this 2.5 to 15 micrograms per kilogram per minute IV. Analgesia dosing, so um, for PACU or even sometimes on the ward, there are protocols for running ketamine. You can give someone five to 10 milligrams IV as a bolus. Or if you run about 10 milligrams per, uh, per hour, IV, not per kilogram, but just 10 milligrams per hour, plus or minus a little bit, depending on the patient's weight and their sensitivity to this medication. It's time for one half distribution is about 16 minutes, which um, parallels its duration of action. And uh, for these infusions, it's, it's context sensitive half time is about 30 minutes, even for um, infusions of greater than four hours. So this is kind of where it maxes out. Which gives you an indication of how long this medication will last um, if you are using it for analgesic purposes as an infusion um, on the ward. 
cardiovascular effects. Um, it, it is a indirect sympathetic um, stimulant, so indirect. And it causes release um, of norepi. So with this, you might see a little bit of tachycardia or a little bit of increase in blood pressure if you give it on its own. Realistically, if you give it after um, also having given a reasonable dose of opioids, you probably won't see these effects as much. But possibly more important is the fact that in absence of um, any indirect sympathetic stimulation from increased norepi release, it actually is a direct myocardial depressant. So although the net effect of this might be a little bit of sympathetic stimulation in a healthy person, someone who um, maybe has already maxed themselves out from a sympathetic drive perspective um, could have decreased blood pressure from the direct myocardial depressant effects of this. So what I mean is, let's say you have someone who uh, was involved in a motor vehicle accident 12 hours ago um, from the periphery and they've been in transport. Um, this is someone who has kind of been maximally stimulated for the last 12 hours um, and they don't have these norepi stores left um, to, to get the boost from the um, indirect release of this. So instead, when you give this person ketamine, you may see a more dominant myocardial depressant effect. Whereas in a healthy person, these things will balance out to a relatively neutral net effect on your hemodynamics. The respiratory effects of this are minimal, which is nice. So very minimal change here. Um, people will maintain spontaneous respirations when given um, doses of ketamine, especially for the analgesic dosing. With, um, with induction dosing, you might get a little bit decreased um, minute ventilation, but um, you can still spontaneously breathe even often with your induction dosing. Central nervous system effects, again, it's a dissociative. Unlike propofol, it can actually increase your cerebral metabolic rate. And it might, or probably also does, increase your cerebral blood flow a little bit. People used to be very concerned about the, um, the net effect of this being increased ICP, but this is debated now. And some people will tell you that this isn't really a real effect of ketamine. Some of the common complications of this are increased secretions. And this can actually make your life very challenging in anesthesia. More secretions can make airway management quite challenging, especially if you need to use uh, video assisted technique that can really get in the way. So you can actually pre-treat with glyco, um, glycopyrrolate, like 0.2 milligrams um, IV or, or some low dose like this to try to decrease the amount of secretions that someone will get with uh, ketamine. We talked about it being a myocardial depression or depressant. It can precipitate laryngospasm. It will also cause hallucination. And people will often co-administer midaz when giving doses above 0.5 milligrams per kilogram um, because these can be quite disturbing for people. And then um, it also causes nausea and vomiting, unfortunately. So similar to etomidate, um, this is an agent that will cause uh, you to be more sick afterwards. Mm -hmm.